and co-founder of a company called Modern Survey, based right here in Minneapolis. And what we do at Modern Survey is we're a human capital measurement company. We have a set of software as a service solutions that our clients use to understand employee engagement at their companies. We can help them understand performance levels of their employees, help them maximize leadership, help them understand why they're losing key talent. Basically, we can help our clients through our software see the stories about their people. We can even bring customer information in, and then through our software, you can see the way all these dynamics work together. As a system, we founded um, Modern Survey 15 years ago. I'm joined here today by Laurel Van Meter, super yogi and fellow entrepreneur. And Laurel, why don't you introduce yourself? I own a yoga studio in Northeast Minneapolis called Yoga Garden that I opened in 2011. I've been a student of yoga for almost 20 years, since 1995. And I've been teaching yoga for over a decade. So I've seen yoga go from a really small um, kind of community-based activity to this huge now market, this huge billion dollar industry. So um, I'm here to talk to you today about that. And what we're really here to share with you today is the discoveries we made together about how we bring together um, a disciplined yoga practice and you smash that together with your entrepreneurial and creative pursuits. You can literally create more and do more um, with your startups, with your life, and with your health. So we want to share with you the discoveries that we made around that. So we're going to start out with a couple of stories. I'm going to still tell you the story about an entrepreneur. So the year is 2008, and this entrepreneur has a startup that he created uh, in 1999, and so it's just turned nine years old. The $3,000 investment that he made with, with his two co-founders in 1999 will now realize $2.5 million in revenue, and they have 25 engaged and amazing employees. This company is winning many accolades. It's been selected as one of the fastest growing private companies in Minnesota. And for the second year in a row, it's been selected as an Inc. 5000 company. In fact, things are going so well for this entrepreneur that he hires a couple of management consultants to help him continue to scale the business so he can pursue some other passions of his which is filmmaking. So he gets to go to the Sundance Institute to work with real directors who are trying to make their first movies. And these are films that get workshopped that get made into real films, like Paper Man, starring Jeff Daniels, and Here, starring Ben Foster. Well, back in August of 2008, the entrepreneur was having lunch with his two management consultants. And this is August. There's a lot going on in the economy. Lehman Brothers has just evaporated, and there's constant coverage uh, on the televisions uh, on CNN about whether or not the Senate is going to pass the $700 billion bailout bill to save the failing banks. And the entrepreneur is having a conversation with his management consultants about what this might mean for the markets, what this might mean for business. Well, a server wanders by, and she overhears the conversation in the restaurant, and she says, so what's the big deal if the markets crash? And one of the management consultants says, really bad stuff, like you might lose your job, or you might not be able to get a student loan. And she says, well, I'm sure they'll figure something out. The entrepreneur gets this intuitive feeling, but this one is not full of optimism. This one's tinged with fear. Well, over the course of the next two months, the financial markets collapse. His clients stop paying him. Major contracts are being canceled. He gets a call from his banker saying he needs him to pay down a $200,000 credit loan in two days. He's never been in a position like this before, and the darkness moves in around him. He wonders, is this what it feels like to lose a loved one? Is this what it feels like to get divorced? Or is this worse? He spends his days trying to convince vendors to pay him. I'm sorry, his clients to pay him, and he spends his, his afternoons negotiating with vendors trying to negotiate more time to be able to pay them. But he's beginning to recognize that no matter how hard he tries to save his business, it may fail. From the darkness, he gets three ideas. Number one, drink heavily. <laughs> Number two, escape to Brooklyn to make insect pornography movies with Isabel Rosaline. And number three, begin a serious yoga practice. Now, he experiments with drinking heavily, but it's not much of a drink or so, that really doesn't amount to much. 
He does escape to Brooklyn to make insect pornography movies with Isabella Rossellini to set up shorts for the Sundance channel. But he spends his lunch breaks on the phone talking to his office manager, trying to help her work with the cash flow crisis they're having back in Minneapolis. So then he decides to experiment with beginning a series of writings. And it starts out with him going to class once a week, and then twice a week, and eventually three times a week. And he finds the practices incredibly challenging, physically overwhelming, but he also finds them cathartic and metaphorical. He's beginning to discover that the experiences he's having on his yoga mat are helping him see the challenges he's having as an entrepreneur. The things he cannot figure out how to fix as a CEO, he is beginning to see a little bit better through his yoga practice. He's beginning to create more space where before he was convinced there was none. And as a result, he's able to navigate his business through the Great Recession and get to the other side. So I get to tell you the story about the yogi. And the story of the yogi begins and um, at this time, it's kind of hard to imagine, but yoga is not cool. There's not a lot of people practicing yoga. And this is at a time before um, Lululemon. This is at a time before um, Core Power Yoga, which is most likely going to be the first uh, chain of yoga studios in the US. So um, at this time, you kind of have to know where to go to find a yoga class. And people are practicing in libraries, churches and community spaces, and you usually kind of have to have somebody refer you to a space in order to even find a class. So there's just nothing fancy about yoga at this time. There's no showers, there's no routines. It's pretty, pretty clunky. So um, she finds a class, she goes, and she immediately falls in love. So by 1998, um, she is completely into yoga, and she's surprised that she's at, been at the altar life, and she's to be so taken with the practice. Um, it's big and mysterious, and she loves how it's about fitness, but she loves that it's as much about stepping into the cycle of infinite possibility as it is about um, the physical practice. So um, by 1998, she's driving everybody crazy, and all she wants to do is talk about yoga. And so at her friend's suggestion, she begins to teach. And this is also at a time before um, training is So she moves all the furniture out of her um, one-bedroom apartment on Hennepin Avenue, and essentially her first yoga studio is born. And she um, teaches her friends from a local coffee shop, and she offers to teach them for free. And uh, they, are, they give her $5. So moving on, 2003, she's quite a few years into it now, and yoga is picking up speed. It's um, starting to become more readily uh, accessible. There's yoga studios starting to pop up, and, and trainings are now available. So she decides that she needs to get training and she's going to continue to teach. So she heads off to the mountains of Austria. And she, for the first time, learns about uh, yoga philosophy. She learns about enlightenment and bliss and the history of yoga. So she comes back to Minneapolis and, um, in 2003 and she rents a space in a hipster art gallery in northeast Minneapolis called Creative Electric Studios. And at this point, everybody's starting to um, want a little more piece of it. So by 2006, um, yoga is now cool. <laughs> Everybody's interested in yoga. She's 10 years into her practice and, and a couple years into teaching. And um, she continues to build up a clientele. She starts teaching therapeutics and she starts teaching corporate clientele. And um, she really starts to create a following. So by 2011, the yoga world is now, um, it's everywhere. You can get yoga mats at Super America. You can get yoga Target, um, it's become pretty competitive. And so she's been at this now for 15 years and she's becoming somewhat of an expert in her field. She begins to be more of a mentor and a teacher to her students. And one of her students um, suggests that she open a yoga studio. And so in 2011, she takes the leap and she opens a yoga garden in Northeast Minneapolis and she literally creates um, space for the first time. And she steps also at this point into the seat of being an I'm Patrick Riley, and I'm that uh, entrepreneur. <laughs> and Yogi. And Yogi. And
And so we're here today to share with you what we've learned about when you bring the frameworks of yoga and the pursuits of an entrepreneur together, you literally can't create a few more. We want to share with you over the next half hour or so what those discoveries are so hopefully you can take away from this um, some knowledge. So, oh, I forgot to jump to the slide. This is the exciting moment of all this stuff that we've learned. And so to, to, to bring this to life now, we're going to give you a little background on yoga, kind of a crash course in the history of yoga, where it came from. And then we'll follow that up with a little background on, on the entrepreneur, and then we're going to bring all of you up for you. All right, so when you hear the word yoga, what are some of the things that you think? What are some words that come to mind when you hear the word yoga? Flexible. Flexible, of course. Meditation. Meditation. Pretzel. Pretzel. <laughs> and so, yes, of course, all of these things are related to yoga, things to think about. Um, so for a little bit of history, the word yoga comes from the root word yuj, which means to yoke. And so um, from the very beginning, the idea of yoga is to um, create unity and to create balance. So um, a more modern definition of it is sometimes explained as to be engaged, right? So you're taking um, all these different things that you have to do as an entrepreneur, all these different decisions that you have to make as an um, entrepreneur and be creative in your, in your field and pull them together. So one way to think about this is as creators and entrepreneurs, you're constantly being in a position where you have to make decisions and be engaged in order to make the best decisions you can as you move forward. So for a little history, um, 5000 BC is generally the year that people give for the origin of yoga. Um, it starts as an oral tradition, so there is no exact date. But um, at this time, it, the world is broken up into two different parts. It's, you've got spirit and you've got matter. Um, everything but spirit is considered an illusion, so actually the body is not even um, on the map here. We also get a book called the Bhagavad Gita, which introduces us to a concept called dharma, which means work. And so the idea of Dharma or work is what is the work you have to do here now in order to be fully engaged. As we move forward, we move into um, 500 BC, into the classical era of yoga, and this is uh, an important thing to um, note. Most of the yoga that's being taught in the US is being taught from a classical point of view. So the classical point of view breaks up the world of yoga into what is referred to as a dualist philosophy. So you have spirit and matter, you have the mind and the body, but the body is considered inferior. So the body is considered something that needs to be cleansed or transformed or overcome in order to get where it is you need to go. And so we also get the idea of transcendence and enlightenment. By 800 AD, things change quite a bit and we move into the post-classical era of yoga. And um, this is where quite a few different schools of yoga start to be born and start to break off. And for the first time, the body and the mind are included in the picture, but the body is now considered equal to, to the mind. And the body is considered a temple. The body is recognized for all of the experiences that you have in the world here now. You have them within, I refer to it as a teacher, the landscape of your body. And so um, it's no longer something that needs to be overcome. It's as much a part of the world as, um, any, as any idea that you have or any idea about where you want to go. So yoga comes to the US in 1893, and it comes to us through this guy, Vivekananda, at the Parliament of Religion in Chicago. And it's taught as um, more of a philosophy and a lifestyle of health than it is a religion. And um, you can kind of see as it goes from the beginning, 5000 BC, and it moves through time, it goes from this idea from uh, transcendence to change. The body is something that's not even included in the part of us is not even included in the picture, to a more modern definition now, where the body is just as important as anything else, and in fact, you have to be fully rooted in your body in order to get where it is you need to go. So for some statistics, um, in 2012, of the 299 million people in this country, 15 million people are doing yoga, so it's becoming a huge industry. It's a $27 billion a year industry increased by 20% in 2012 of the population, and revenues in the last five years are up 87%. So it's just an enormous industry, and it's not something, so you can see, as somebody that started 
practicing yoga so many years ago, it's just changed so dramatically in order to um, continue to teach and to have a studio that I have to be really clear about what is it that I'm teaching, what's my message as an entrepreneur in order to stay in the game. So now we'll talk about the entrepreneur a little bit. So when you guys hear the word entrepreneur, what are the words that come to mind? Crazy. Crazy? <laughs> yeah. What's that? Brave. Brave. Inventor, risk taker, disruptor, creator. This is high risk stuff. These are people that are really driven to be able to do creative <coughs> things and, and create new industries and create new businesses. So a little background on kind of the, the entrepreneur. I'll uh, we'll start with the definition. So if you go to the Webster Dictionary and you look up the word entrepreneur, this is the definition you see. One who organizes, manages, and assumes the risks of a business or an enterprise. This just doesn't do it for me. The idea of assuming risk. Um, I feel like a, a bank manager or something when I see this. Um, so let's go back in time and get some more perspective because I think we need to get to a more modern understanding of what an entrepreneur really is right now in 2014. So Jean Baptiste Say, French economist, um, really is sort of the beginning of the entrepreneurial concept. And he came up with this idea, this philosophy that if you create a new thing, sort of create a supply, there's an inherent demand that follows. And they call this Say's Law. You guys probably remember this from your economics class in college. So it's the idea when you build a new thing, people will buy it. So no one knew they needed an iPhone until they saw one, and then they're like, I want that. So that's really the beginning concept of being an entrepreneur. Fast forward to 1934. Joseph Schumpeter is a famous Austrian economist, and he's the one that comes up with this great phrase called creative destruction. And his thesis is that over time, it's, it's good for industries to be disrupted because it's good for it's good uh, for civilization, it's good for countries, it's good for people overall. It may be painful in the short term as industries get reworked, but over time, it's a good thing. And creative destruction has really now taken a more uh, modern term now, which we call disruption today when we think about um, creating a company. Then there's Howard Stevenson, a famous Harvard Business School professor, and he came up with this definition in 1974, or 1975. For the entrepreneur, which is this. Entrepreneurship is the pursuit of opportunity without regard to resources currently controlled. I love this because it's about going for it, it's about doing it, it's about not looking at obstacles, it's pushing forward. And to back that up, look at this data, this is from the Kauffman Institute in 2009, so it's a few years old, but it still gets to the idea. Of the fastest growing companies in 2009, um, only 16% of them were funded by venture capital. The remaining 84% were non-VC funded. When people want to create new businesses, they want to create a new concept, they make it happen, they will it into existence, and that's a beautiful thing. But it's also an incredibly demanding process. So when we think of creative destruction or disruption, Google, what do they disrupt? Search. Well, <laughs> yellow pages initially, right? So search, so that's where the, they took all that money, that all that advertising dollars that used to go into looking up a plumber or looking up a service in the phone book, it moved to Google through AdWords, and they were able to turn that into a whole gigantic industry. I mean, now it's a tool set we can't live without. And Netflix, what did they disrupt? Content delivery. Right, the video store. So this is how this process works, and it goes on and on and on. So let's take a walk in the shoes of an entrepreneur, because I, I love this, and being one myself, these things happen to me often. So you're out for a walk in the park one day, maybe it's a beautiful spring day, you have your favorite beverage, maybe it's a chai latte or a decaf espresso or something. And you're walking along and then you get that idea, that little idea for something new. And first you think you're crazy and you rethink it again. And then you get on the phone, maybe you call your friend or a colleague or your mom or somebody like, what do you think about this idea? And he or she says, like, that's kind of a good idea. And you start, you start to bring it to life as that the beginning of creation. It's really a beautiful thing because there's nothing in the way. There's no obstacle, it's all potential at that point. And if you even kind of know what you're doing, you start moving in the process of creating shape around this idea. And you typically start with a vision. And the vision is, what is this thing gonna look like in two or three years? Where is this going? And then, if you're a little bit more experienced, you may flank this by a mission and objectives. The mission is why you're doing what you're doing, and then the objectives really get it sort of how you're and then you get into the strategy. The strategy is really where the work 
packet. It took me years, by the way, to kind of learn this template, but it really does work. So the strategy is where you spend your time. This is where the work happens. This is where you toil away 10, 12, 14 hours a day. Um, and at some point, all that optimism turns into exhaustion. And you spin and you spin and you keep trying to move the idea forward. This is where it starts to get thick. This is where it starts to get complicated. And at some point, you become a, become a little delusional. And this is a beautiful thing, sort of balance between delusion and potential, but this is where the entrepreneur dwells. But this can be an exhausting, overwhelming, crazy place to be. And what can oftentimes happen, and certainly has happened to me, is you find yourself lost. You get to a point with the business, whether it's running out of money, running out of ideas, or just plain exhausting, you just can't see your way forward. It's just too thick, you're lost in the forest, and you can't move forward, you can't move on. So this is where um, I usually get people when they come to class. We live so much of our lives um, just completely in our head, trying to read and all things intellectually. So you come to class, you come to class and you're kind of in the forest, this is the way I think of it. So you step onto your mat, and in the first five minutes, all we do is we just begin simply and we start to move. And you start to shift from what you think to the way you feel. So nothing happens until something moves. And with just a little bit of movement, things start to change. By 15 minutes into class, um, you've completely forgotten whatever it was that you were so um, stuck in your head when you got to class. And you're starting to solve problems physically. And this is a difficult thing to um, articulate with words. And this is really something, as I said before, you really have to think it. And it happens through movements. The, the actions that you're creating on your mat begin to come a metaphor for solving problems. And you start to work your way through in a physical way. By 30 minutes, um, I, we were working towards an apex pose. And I may call a pose something like handstand, which seems totally ridiculous to some people. But what I love about this is that um, at this point, we've, we've worked through the class. We've gone from the um, idea of solving problems intellectually to using the way we move ourselves on our mat as a reflection of the way we make decisions to the apex pose. And whether or not you can get this pose or not, it doesn't matter. You've um, shown yourself that through these different actions that you're making, that there is another way to solve problems and that you can step into the format of your yoga practice and start to think about things in a physical way. So everybody in the class is going to do their own version of this pose. And whether or not they get the pose by the end of the class, it really, it really doesn't matter. What seemed possible to begin with is starting to seem a little bit more tangible. So 45 minutes, um, we move into this pose, which is called corpse pose, which is everybody's favorite pose. And you just lie on your back. And through the process of going through this, um, this class and going through these sequences and problem solving in this way, even though you were stuck in the forest and stuck in this um, spinning around in your head, but 45 minutes later, you're able to lie on your back and rest peacefully going through this practice and taking yourself into the physical world. So um, you've proved to yourself through this that you can make it through the forest, that you've made it to the clearing, and you can go back to work and now solve your problems and think about things with a clear head. And so much of this is really about that moving from your head and your body and back again. And for me as an entrepreneur, this has just been an incredible discovery because it really changes things dramatically what, what we need to get done. And we were just talking about this the other night, how um, there's, I mean, I've been practicing yoga what, for five or six years now. And when I first went into class, I couldn't do anything. I was a, I was a total beginner. But, um, but I found so much value in it over the years. But even like a couple of days ago, after I had worked a 12 or 14 hour day, and, and World's Yoga Studio is like a half block from my office. And um, I'm like, oh, I don't wanna go, you know, because it's just like one of those crazy days. But you get in, you walk into the studio, and it's amazing as you start making, you cycle through the first five or 10 minutes, like the, the practice, the way the world is described, you literally go into a place where everything changes. And you move out of your head and your body, and things start to shift. They really do start to change. And you can, you just get to a place that's incredibly grounded and gives you so much more perspective on the work you're doing. You start to solve problems. You see the problems in different ways that weren't there even just a few minutes before. So we're gonna kind of answer some questions and have a bit of a conversation around a few different concepts, and then we want to invite you guys into the conversation as well. Um, and so this is really about kind of sharing and learning around this concept. 
So the first one is, is why is practicing yoga a necessity for being an entrepreneur, at least from our perspective? So Laurel, you want to And so this comes out of the idea of why yoga and not going for a run or going for a swim, why, why in particular yoga? And so one of the things that um, I think about as having been an athlete my whole life and done several physical activities, like when I told the story of the yogi, when I walked into class, even on my first class, I couldn't believe how complicated it was and how big it was. And that you would learn how to do, even just orienting yourself spatially on your mat took a tremendous amount of awareness. And um, you learn how to do these different moves like triangle pose or whatever these different, you make these different shapes. And even touching your toes and you go through these activities and, and then you learn how to do them. You flip everything on its side and you learn how to do it in the back bend, or you learn how to do it balancing or you learn how to do it twisting. So everything that you do um, creates more capacity. And I think it's a, it's a great metaphor for being an entrepreneur because you have to wear all the different hats as an entrepreneur. You have to do, um, you know, starting out, you have to do the hiring, you have to do the bookkeeping, you start the company, you have to do everything. And in order to do all those things and do them well, you have to create a lot of capacity. And uh, another thing that's fascinating is, which is why we gave you the history lesson too, is how both the entrepreneur and this idea of yoga is a fairly esoteric tradition that have now become incredibly accessible for us here in 2014, right? Meaning if I want to be an entrepreneur, there's not a lot of obstacles. I just need a, you know, a MacBook Pro and a coffee shop or a couple of founders and I can get an idea off the ground. And likewise, there's maybe across the street, there's a yoga studio. So why is this stuff, like what does this mean? And this is what's so interesting. So, and, and my, my hypothesis, I know Laurel shares this with me too, is that as we continue to move into the knowledge of the knowledge economy in this sort of abstract way of working and living is incredibly ambiguous um, and there's not a lot of definition, there's not a lot of boundaries and we're looking for that stuff. We need like new toolkits to help us be able to do that, both from a have discipline to be able to create a company, knowing we need to do that, and physically having a toolkit too that helps us work incredibly hard and be able to you know, get comfortable with the ambiguity and be able to keep moving towards things that are important for us. Um, and the other, I'm just gonna make another point, I got a little of those. Oh yeah. And the other one is um, the idea, well, I guess we talked about this a little bit, but it's the idea of metaphor. So for me, my background, even before I was an entrepreneur, I've always been a, I've always been a creative. I worked, I mean, we, we talked about the green porno. The reason why I did uh, stuff for Sundance is I was a filmmaker before I was an entrepreneur. I played in bands for years, so I've always had a very creative background. It's about making stuff. I'm constantly looking for metaphors, kind of seeing how things overlay, because that's fascinating to me. And yoga gives you this ability to see that. And, and I can't even over describe what it was like in the Great Recession for me personally. So just put yourself where I was in 2008. I share with you the story, but literally I was in situations where I'd walk out of the door on Friday and I needed to find $65,000 by Monday morning to make payroll. And I didn't know where that was coming from. And that happened every two weeks, every two weeks. And I had 25 employees. And I couldn't, flip, I couldn't freak them out, but you know, I had to find a way to solve these problems because we still had customers, we're still moving along. That's, an, that's like an impossible, it feels like an impossible thing. And you just, you get to a place where you're like, I need something. And that was about the time I started to practice yoga with Laurel and it, it changed everything. Like literally I would get done with the practice and I would be almost weeping because I would start to see things in ways that were just unbelievable. And I'd be like, I think I see a way through this. Like literally things would be revealed to me. And I'm not sure if there's any other way than yoga that that would have happened for me because it was that intense, and yoga is that intense in a beautiful way. Yeah, I think that you have to think about what you're doing because there's nothing repetitive about it. It's not front body repetitive motion. And I think when you step into your mat and you're in a class, you're also, you don't know where you're going. And you're being <coughs> asked to do, you don't know what you're going to be asked to do until you're asked to do it. And I think that's kind of similar to what you're saying is you're constantly being new set of problems and you don't know you're, what you're going to have to resolve until they're right in front of you. So it's a great metaphor for that. Yeah, it is, which leads us to our next question, which gets to just how do you create more space? And um, so when you start practicing yoga, um, a big part of what you're trying to do is, and this takes a, took me years to even begin to get it, is you're trying to open up these little bits of space in your body so you can kind of find new areas of strength and flexibility. And first, someone starts to describe you where that space kind of is in your leg. 
And so you just keep showing up, you keep working on it. And at, one, at some point, that's, that just opens up. And through that, you're able to start to, you can start to make your way towards another pose and sort of another sequence towards other things. And it's, I think it's really phenomenal to be able to make that journey. And that's a perfect metaphor for running a business. So I started out with three founders. We have 35 employees now. And the thing that's so crazy about that process is, first, there's just the three of you, and you're doing everything. And it's insanity. And then at some point, you literally have to find ways to open up more space in the business to be able to you know, get things moving forward. So how do you do that? Um, and so uh, it, it's, a, it's a constant mindset you live in. You're, it's endless. Because as soon as you uh, open up one space, then there's another one you have to start to think about. Mm -hmm. And I think I learned this too when I opened up a yoga studio. I'd been teaching for 10 years before, and I'd been renting space. So in my mind, I was thinking, well, I'll continue to do the same thing. Like, now I'll be making my own space. And of course, that's not what happened. I opened a business. And um, the first few months were really frustrating as I was getting used to that idea. And so my way of resolving problems in the past was just to work harder, right? And it's kind of a linear approach. And um, as a business owner and having the space that I had to take care of, where I had to hire people, I had to get more people and I had to figure out payment, all these different things, working harder was not going to solve the problem, right? What I needed was to um, kind of stand where I was and let things open up. And then through letting things open up, take a look at what was in front of me and make decisions based on that. And so that's a completely different way of understanding resolving problems that arise as an entrepreneur. Now, had I not done that in my yoga practice for so many years before, I would not have understood that as completely um, as I did then. And one of the things that I often do to use my yoga practice as, a, as an entrepreneur is I remind myself of the things that I can do. And some of them I take for granted now, like doing the handstand and taking those with back bends and doing you know, some of the stuff that seems a little bit crazy, but um, but I'm so used to doing now, and I kind of take it for granted. But I had to do a lot of work in order to get to that place. It wasn't like I just stepped onto my yoga mat and I all of a sudden do all these things. I worked at it for years, and I learned through learning how to do these specific poses that um, I say this to you guys as students a lot. Like, don't make it harder than it is because the effort is going to come and find you. Um, and so, and where you think the work is is going to probably be. In So third question, the final one, and then we want to hear from you guys. Um, how do you use the space that you create? You want to lead off? Go ahead. Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll use this analogy. So recently, um, I took over the sales department at my company, Modern Survey. And it was, um, and there was a bunch of work that had to be done. So um, the person that had been running it was, was going okay, but it needed to get, it needed to be built to scale. And so when I jumped into the seat sort of of the sales manager, which I'd never managed sales before, I'm more of a product development sort of person. Um, like I, I jumped in and basically my job it was spinning plates and it's like there was like clowns running around me sort of being out <coughs> not, not many people that worked for me, but it was just like, it was like being in the circus. There was just no way, it just madness because the process wasn't designed well. And I'm, so I basically spent three months kind of watching the clowns, like getting to stop my people just conceptually. And then to keep spending the plates to kind of keep things going. I'm like, how am I going? What do I need to do to get this thing organized? I've got to spend that plate. What do I got to do to get this stuff organized? So, um, so I've been I've, I've been in this place before many times as an entrepreneur, and so you have to kind of figure out how to package that up and work that and get out of it so you can get more space so you can get up to the next thing. That's that's just like your work over and over and over and over again. And um, at the same time, I have been working on um, getting into a um, Headstand, and Laurel had been working with me on this. Because I'm working on handstand, I can do it against the wall, I can get to spot me, I can't breathe style like that. But, um, but I was trying to get headstand in the middle of the room, which basically means you're kind of on your head and your shoulders, or in your elbows. And um, so I was starting to work on that, and it was just starting to get revealed to me, <coughs> ever so slowly as I make my way up into it, and just, even just a few weeks ago. And I was like, wow, it, it isn't, I just did the things I was supposed to do, and one day it was just there. And that's the step, again, that was like the metaphor for me with the sales thing. It's like stick with it, keep doing what you need to do, and eventually it started to come together. And those two things literally started to happen in tandem. So just like three weeks ago, we got all, like, this finished designing the sales process, you know, have all the account executives working, have Salesforce integrated, lead management, everything is going great. 
So now I've got all this space. But now what do you do with that? So then you get to this next dilemma where you have to start building boundaries for yourself because with wide open space comes great responsibility. So you have to start figuring out, okay, where, do I, where are my margins, where do I go next to kind of continue to get things moving forward. And yoga, is, that's what it does to you over and over again. You practice as you're living that, you're working through it. So it just kind of sort of a guide through, through that process. Yeah, and I think that um, one of the things that it does is it helps you to continually step into that process and keep stepping into that space so that things are ambiguous. Keep stepping into that white space. And the example that I, you and I were just talking about this, it could be getting into a handstand or it could be something as simple as touching your toes, which takes a lot of work because a lot of people when they go <coughs> to yoga for the first time can't do things as simple as just holding forward and touching their toes. They don't have the flexibility to do that. And they may work for months in order to do that. And it seems so simple, but it's a huge accomplishment. So whether it's something as simple as touching your toes or getting up into a headstand, um, you work for weeks or months or however long to get it, and you do, and you have this little like moment of like I got it, celebration. It could last for you know ten minutes or however long, but it doesn't last very long. And you immediately go into like well, where does this go from here? And you start building on it, and you continue to step back again. You're the beginner again. You step back into that place of unknowing. And so I think the physical um, understanding of that and really feeling how that creates more strength and the practice is so much about. Um, creating the space and learning how to create that space and the strength is in holding that space and then carrying all that information with you as you move forward. And to be able to feel that physically is just, it's just, I think, invaluable metaphor for being an entrepreneur and for when you're confronted with difficulties or having to take your business, like build a sales team up and take it to the next level, you've got an idea that you can do that and you've already done the work somewhere. So I think that's, that's sort of the, the conversation that we wanted to have, but we'd love to hear from you guys in terms of questions that you may have or, or feedback. This is some new material for us. We're just beginning to kind of share. I'm just curious if you find this interesting, and then or if you have any comments or things that you want to add to it. Yes, sir. So it, it, it almost sounded the way you were explaining it that you would go to a yoga class and have an apex potentially every day or within a week frustrated moment is, do you think it's important when you take the yoga class? I mean, if, if most mornings, you know, you're, you're going to work, you're feeling okay, and then as the day builds, it gets you know, potentially more frustrating. Um, is it more important, do you think, to take the class later in the day, or can you be just as effective if you're you know, taking it two or three times early in the morning? This is a good question, because <coughs> it's so hard for people to get to class. I mean, it's hard. I think the time of day, I think, is very uh, personal. But I think it's more important to create a pattern of getting to your mat. And it can be a from or in class. And it doesn't have to be for an hour and a half every once a week. It could be for 10 minutes every day, for 10 minutes every other day. I think one of the things that's important that you get out of this as you practice yoga is that you learn that you're, it's a reflection and you're seeing patterns. You're seeing the way you make decisions. You're seeing the way you react. And it's not so different than the way you react when you get those challenges off your mat. And so I think that, um, I think the part of it Patrick was talking about that's cathartic is that all of that is somewhat emotional and all of that is somewhat physical. And when you have to do that physically first and you create a pattern of knowing you can do that, that's the important part of it, is just getting to your mat. I would say once a week. For me, it was for me. It's after work, it's evenings. It's just always been that way, partially because I start early. And, um, I'm not ready to stretch at seven in the morning or six in the morning or something. Um, and you know, and like I, like I shared earlier, it's kind of one day a week, twice a week, three times a week. But it's always I've had a pretty regular schedule, and even in, in the last three or four months, I've started to now do a practice at home too. So I probably have four or five times a week, something like that. But, yes, ma'am. Uh, so I'm a teacher casually, and I was like. Startup right now yeah. around entrepreneurship, my own entrepreneurs um, at this point, anyways. But um, just to kind of build on what you guys were just talking about, um, there are 
studies out there that your stress response, whether you are working out and building muscle and that stress that you're feeling there, or you're being like chased by a lion or under a stress alert, your stress response, the chemicals that are released and happen in your brain is the same. Mm -hmm. So when you're on the mat and you're building up those responses to whatever stresses they are, whether it's um, you know, twisting more or attempting uh, different poses that maybe you're either not succeeding at or maybe you do succeed at, that stress response that you're building and practicing there on your mat translates directly out to your like physiological stress response wherever you're at in the world. And that's, that's why yoga works. Um, not necessarily because uh, you're releasing stress while you're on the mat. Yeah, and it's also, it's a, well, I'm in a, a women's business group, and one of the things that we go around, we meet once a month, and everybody goes around the table and talks about um, what's going on in their business. And one of the things that everybody says is that they get stuck in their head when things start to go south. And they get stuck in their head, and they start to um, think about where it's going to go and how bad it's going to be and what terrible things are going to happen. And then by the time the situation is resolved, it's never as bad as they thought it was going to be. And so I think that that's part of what you're doing on a yoga mat is getting into the physical way of solving problems. It's very different than doing it intellectually. And we have a, we live so much of our life stuck in our head trying to figure things out. There's a physical and metaphorical way to do it as well. And I see that even in yoga. I know for me, after I had been doing yoga for a little while, um, friends who maybe other entrepreneurs are they're like, you seem so much more chill now. <laughs> you know? And I, so I think it does, like it really does affect that. And I can tell you, I mean, with a with a fast growth business, because we're back in fast growth mode, and it's crazy and fun, but it's just there's crazy products going on in your lap and you know, and there's I mean like you know, data breach going on here or whatever, something you're just like, okay, it's gonna be a major problem. But like literally when those things are happening, um, we, we did not have data breach by the way, just there. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell me. <laughs> we have a lot of customers. Um, that um, yeah, you just you're like okay. There's a there's actually you're able to get back to your breathing. I use the breathing. I've learned yoga, and it takes. I feel like I'm back on my mat. It's familiar. I'm here. Okay, let's let me hear all the information. Let's not panic. Let's not do things. So it really helps you. I mean, as a leader, and as someone who needs to deal with some incredibly stressful things, it really helps. Yeah, and it just brings it back around. It's most important that you get on the mat, mm -hmm. regardless of what time of day, and you get on the mat. Yeah, and it's really, yeah. and that just becomes a discipline, it's a focus, yeah. and it just really gives you, it really gets back to what you're sharing, which is great. Other questions? Yes? Yeah, not really questions, um, just like observations over like, um, I always think people look at yoga as like a feminine thing, mm -hmm. and then also like entrepreneurial shit maybe is a masculine thing, and so this is kind of like a cool bridge and breaking down people's stereotypes. Um, and then, you know, I look at like the symbols of yoga and how it's like represented to the public as like um, usually some crazy pose, somebody's doing a handstand or somebody's doing like bird of paradise. And maybe that gives people even more pause and like, I can't do that. There's no way I can touch my toes. Where I'm always refreshed when I see symbols of like maybe um, overweight people doing yoga, where I'm just like so refreshed to see it's not about what you do. It's not about like the end result or what you achieve. We need more symbols of like um, average people doing yoga and you get the same benefits. And it's it's not a different kind of yoga and it's not a modified yoga. It's not just yoga. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean it's a really interesting. It's a really good point because even one of the things that I've had to learn teaching yoga is there's no perfect class. There's so many different people doing it at totally different levels. You know, and even regardless of what I'm calling the class, because I never know who's going to show up. You know, and you have to really learn to teach who's there. And so you kind of have to teach to the middle. And I, I use the example of handstand because I think it's a good example of that. And I purposefully use that example because most of the people in the class are not going to be able to do that pose when I call it the pose. And the idea is that it's not about that one pose. It's not about doing all this stuff so you can get into a handstand. It's all about stuff that you did along the way. And to be engaged in your practice in a way that you understand that that's more important and that you feel that maybe and that you feel better about what it was you're able to accomplish and that most importantly you prove to yourself that you can step into that framework and get out of your head for now. That's a really good point. Um, I was in class yesterday and it was like a fugitive bird of paradise and I'm like well I'm not going to be able to do this mm -hmm. so I think I just went to child's pose instead of like yeah. doing 
including all the steps that lead up to it. Like there's, you know, it's not the final result. It's, it's all that work that goes into the preparation. And maybe I will never actually be able to do it, but that's really not what the point. Right. And I think it's important when you teach to teach the class in that way. That if you are moving towards a more advanced pose like that, because most people aren't going to be able to do that. That's a really advanced pose. Yeah. Um, that you're giving them the steps so they can go back and see the work. Like, well, I couldn't do that, but what are some of the things that I can work on along the way? And I could get a little taste of it along the way. I mean, it's the same thing with like being an entrepreneur and owning, owning a yoga studio. Like, I had to have somewhat of an idea looking back that I was going to be able to run a successful yoga business. I had to have some idea of that because it would have been just crazy for me to open the doors without having. more of a deal where there's 50 people in the room and you go through a sequence. And that's a very different way of practicing yoga than what I'm doing and my teachers are doing in the yoga garden, where there's maybe 10 or 15 people in the room. I know each one of them individually. Most of my students come two or three times a week. And we have certain poses that we're working towards and I'm tying it into the way we're making the decisions and using their mat as a reflection of how you're making the decisions very much more of an individual way of teaching. So they're two very different things. She's taking a niche, a niche position. Yeah. Your studio beautiful, all the plants and everything. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. you know, it could also end up being a different Yeah. Position, yeah. Poor Carl will bring in a lot of people mm -hmm. because they do and they're all over. Yeah. And anybody that, you know, maybe 
looks at what you're doing and has and wants or needs that more individualized. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for saying so. Yeah. Well, I think we better wrap up our next group. Thank you guys.